Walking corpse syndrome, or Cotard's delusion, is a very rare disorder in which the person suffering from it believes that they are dead, or believes that they have dead or decaying body parts. And as if that isn't unpleasant enough, many of them also experience terrifying hallucinations of maggots crawling all over their rotting flesh, or believe that they have missing body parts or internal organs. So how on earth does a person, a person who might otherwise be very lucid and intelligent, come to believe something this insane? How does a feeling, thinking, breathing, living person come to lose touch of reality to this degree, when everything that they are experiencing should be telling them that their belief makes absolutely no sense? This is a syndrome which has confused psychiatrists and neuroscientists for a very long time now, and while the puzzle is still not complete, there are some fascinating new findings which do shed light on how the brain is malfunctioning to produce this delusion, and how there is a ring of truth to it. This video is all about how the brain generates this bizarre disorder, and how it makes the madness actually make a whole lot of sense. And with that, we will now dive into the strange world of walking corpse syndrome. The story of this strange brain disorder starts in 1880 with a French neurologist and psychiatrist named Jules Cotard. In 1880 he gave a lecture in Paris in which he reported the very curious case of a 43 year old woman with severe depression who claimed to have no brain, no nerves, no stomach and no soul. Her belief was that neither God or the devil existed, that she did not need to eat, as of course who does need to eat when you're dead and that she would exist as mere flesh and bone for all eternity. So she was both dead and immortal. Obviously, this was very interesting to Dr. Cotard, and he theorised that what he was looking at was a whole new form of depression, one which includes a strange kind of nihilistic and anxious melancholia. In later years, many more cases of this syndrome popped up, and Cotard as well as other scientists over the centuries have reported that these strange ideas of damnation and death take different forms with different patients. Some believe that they have missing organs or body parts, like the women that Cotard originally described, whereas others believe that they have them, but that they are rotting away. Some believe that the rotting is occurring only within specific organs or body parts, whereas others believe that their entire body is rotting away. It is worth noting though, before we dissect what is going on at the neural level, that there are additional symptoms within Cotard delusion which must be probed in order to understand how the brain is generating this disorder. Key to this story is that these patients report an extreme sense of emotional and sensory numbness, even claiming that they have lost the very ability to think or to form memories, and they deny that they even have a mind or a functioning brain. In its most extreme form, Many report that their very soul has been destroyed or that they simply do not exist. Interestingly, some also assert that other people or places do not exist either, with some denying the existence of their entire families, their city, the doctor they are speaking with, or even that the whole world and time do not exist. Although it is worth noting that these externally directed delusions are less common, as most of their delusions are directed at themselves. Others, however, report they are being possessed, that they are insensitive to pain, and in the most severe cases, as has already been mentioned, also mutilate themselves or attempt suicide. Many of them report that they are damned to exist eternally within this dead state, like a strange kind of purgatory where they just can't make themselves die. Cotard's delusion is an extremely rare disorder, with just 200 known cases worldwide. It tends to affect those who are sustaining some kind of brain injury or illness, as patients who develop Cotard syndrome tend to have some kind of neurological malady, like epilepsy, 
encephalopathy, migraine, stroke, or dementia. So this is a disorder which tends to affect older people, typically those of middle age or older. Furthermore, those who develop Cotard's delusion also tend to have a history of psychiatric problems, including depression, anxiety, or schizophrenia. Additionally, a history of substance abuse is also commonly associated with this syndrome. And while some of these features may seem like obvious precipitators of this kind of psychosis, this comorbidity of Cotard's delusion with neurological and psychiatric disorders also makes it harder for scientists to isolate its neurological causes. But while there is currently no single theory of what causes Cotard syndrome, there are fortunately several hypotheses which do attempt to explain it and which slot together very well to explain what is going on in the brain of someone with this delusion. I will of course go into each of these hypotheses in great detail, but they can initially be quickly summarised in the following way. Firstly, the left side of the brain, also called the left hemisphere, goes crazy. This occurs because the right hemisphere and the front of the brain have become damaged, and this means that the left hemisphere is not receiving enough input from the other half of the brain, or from the front of the brain, as part of this dual mechanism theory. This lack of input from both structures causes the left hemisphere to become delusional. And because the right hemisphere is damaged, the normal equal balance of control that is usually shared between the left and right hemispheres is disrupted. Now, the delusional left hemisphere is in sole control. And under this theory, the left hemisphere therefore becomes a delusional dictator over your beliefs and your interpretation of yourself and the world around you. It is thought that delusions in general tend to form this way. The second hypothesis is that the emotional centre of the brain stops working. When this happens, a person can no longer generate emotions, and this lack of emotions, or reduced emotions, is interpreted by the brain as indicating that they are dead, or that they don't exist. This is quite an old hypothesis, called the ramachandran Blakesley hypothesis, which was proposed in 1998 but it is still one of the main theories of how the delusion forms. And finally, the third hypothesis, which is a much more recent idea, is that Kotar's delusion is a disorder of altered consciousness, whereby the brain resembles the activity of someone in a coma. And there is fortunately a substantial body of evidence for each of these hypotheses, which altogether form numerous puzzle pieces which fit very well together to make this madness make sense. And with that said, we will now look at each hypothesis in great detail and see how they all slot together as puzzle pieces to create this fascinating delusion. So, let's turn to the first hypothesis, that the left side of the brain goes crazy. It is well documented within neuroscience that delusional disorders are associated with damage to the right hemisphere and to the front of the brain and it is argued to be an important mechanism underlying the genesis of a delusional disorder. This is called the two-factor theory of delusions, and in this theory, the first factor affects your perception of yourself and your world, and the second factor affects your beliefs and the way that you evaluate them. This two-factor theory is applied to all sorts of delusional disorders, such as the more obvious ones like schizophrenia, but also to so-called monothematic delusional disorders, in which the person has only one specific delusion, such as within Cotard's delusion, rather than experiencing a range of delusions, such as within a disorder like schizophrenia. In a recent and fascinating paper published by the New York neurologist Dr. Oren Davinsky, Dr. Davinsky argued that the two-factor theory can be applied to Cotard's delusion as a dual mechanism theory of Cotard's syndrome. Let's look at this in more detail. Here we can see the human brain. The outer surface of the brain is called the cerebral cortex. The cerebral cortex is formed of both the left and right hemispheres. Each hemisphere is generally specialised for different functions, which is called hemispheric lateralisation. The left hemisphere, in general, receives a lot of praise due to the fact that it handles reading, writing and calculations, and is overall seen to be the more logical side of the brain. Particularly relevant for the dual mechanism hypothesis of Cotard's delusion, though, is the fact that the left hemisphere is also known as the interpreter, a name given to it by the distinguished cognitive neuroscientist Michael Gazzaniga.
Kazanaga argues that the left hemisphere constantly interprets our emotional and cognitive responses to our environment. In this way, the interpreter therefore keeps a running narrative of our thoughts and actions, and is thought to produce our more conscious emotions. So, the importance of the left hemisphere cannot be overstated. Nonetheless, it is still a massive oversimplification of brain function to ascribe logic and reasoning abilities solely to the left side, as it takes two hemispheres to be logical. And this fact is demonstrated beautifully when it comes to the development of psychotic delusions such as Cotard syndrome. So let's take a closer look at the unappreciated right hemisphere. In 1972, Italian scientist Dr Guido Gainotti proposed the right hemisphere hypothesis, which asserts that the right hemisphere is dominant for emotional processing, which he proposed after working with patients with damage confined to either the left or right sides of their brains. In addition to this, the right hemisphere is also dominant for self-processing. In other words, it has the critical function of processing and generating your sense of your physical self and it also enables you to distinguish yourself from your environment, to process internal bodily sensations, urges and experiences, and also to generate your emotional response to these experiences. In addition, a huge advantage of the right hemisphere is that it processes information holistically. In other words, it integrates information about your body, your internal sense of self, and your environment from multiple sources, whereas the left hemisphere is more analytical. The fact that the right hemisphere is able to integrate multiple sources of information in this way, as well as the right hemisphere's role in self-processing, enables it to detect inconsistencies between ideas about the world and reality. In this way, the right hemisphere serves a vital role as a mediator of reality-based beliefs. It does this because, ultimately, the right hemisphere detects conflict between your beliefs versus what you actually observe or experience in the real world. And when this conflict is detected, it enables you to update your beliefs in light of the observed sensory evidence. So the right hemisphere is vital for grasping an accurate perception of yourself and the world around you. However, once damage has been sustained to the right hemisphere, the left hemisphere no longer receives these reality monitoring inputs from the right hemisphere regarding information about yourself, your emotions or your environment. Now, your left hemisphere must continue to try to interpret yourself and your external world as the interpreter. But now, the right hemisphere is damaged, so it lacks this information about yourself and your world due to the silent right hemisphere. And so the left hemisphere does not receive this valuable information. So not only does the left hemisphere remain stuck in its role as the grand interpreter, but it also now adopts a new role as creative narrator, in that it starts effectively making things up and to look for order and reason, even when there isn't any. This is the mechanism for how delusions in general are thought to form, no matter what delusional disorder a patient has, due to the damage which is consistently found in delusional patients within their right hemisphere. But in regards to Cotard's delusion, this lack of input from the right hemisphere about bodily information or emotional experience is misinterpreted by the Cotard syndrome patient as I must be dead. However, for the delusion to form and to be maintained, there needs to be just one more thing in addition to right hemisphere damage, which is damage to the front of the brain. In other words, damage to the frontal lobes as this forms the second part of the dual mechanism theory. So this brings us back to basic brain anatomy again, and specifically to the four cortical lobes of the brain. Both the left and right hemispheres have four lobes each, with both having an occipital lobe, a parietal lobe, a temporal lobe, and a frontal lobe. Each lobe also has its own specialised functions, and to give an extremely brief overview, the occipital lobe is responsible for visual processing, the parietal lobe is responsible for proprioception, sensory processing and motor control. The temporal lobe is important for auditory processing and memory. And the frontal lobe is critical for reasoning, problem solving and executive functions. And while the right hemisphere is specialised for reality monitoring, the frontal lobes are pivotal for this process of updating your beliefs 
a function which is particularly important for your right frontal lobe. When you interact with your environment, your brain generates an internal model of the environment based upon sensory inputs, so based on what you can see, feel or hear. As it does this, it makes predictions about what it expects to encounter and releases so-called prediction error signals if these predictions turn out to be incorrect. In this way, you have two processes going on. Firstly, you have top-down processes, which are your beliefs and expectations about what you will see, hear or otherwise experience and which are contained within the frontal lobes. Secondly, you have bottom-up processes, which is where the sensory inputs are being received from your eyes, ears and so on. Normally, these processes interact to check whether your expectations of what you expect to experience match up which is a kind of reality monitoring, which, as we recall, is mostly covered by the right hemisphere. However, when your expectation of what you expect to see or experience does not match with what you actually experience, your frontal lobes produce error signals. These error signals enable you to update your beliefs, as you are seeing evidence that your belief or expectation is not correct. However, if you are unable to produce these error signals, then you are unable to make your beliefs consistent with observable reality, as you are not able to update your expectations and beliefs with this new information. After all, delusions themselves are defined as fixed beliefs, which persist even when clear evidence is presented to disprove them. This so-called perseverance in belief is a core feature of a delusion. How else could someone with Cotard syndrome maintain the delusion that they are dead, when all they should need to do to dispel that belief is to simply check their own pulse? This explains why delusions can get so crazy and stubborn, as the person is unable to detect that their beliefs are incorrect, or even insane. But none of this explains why this specific delusion forms in Cotard's delusion. Why does a patient with Cotard syndrome develop this delusion rather than some other kind of delusion? Why this belief rather than a belief that the government is out to get them or a belief that they are a god or some other kind of more common pathological delusion? Well, to answer this question, we must now turn to our second hypothesis, to the ramachandran Blakesley hypothesis. This hypothesis was first proposed in 1998 and is one of the older theories of Cotard syndrome, which is still widely cited. Together, neuroscientists V.S. Ramachandran and Sandra Blakesley proposed that Cotard's delusion forms as a result of a reduced emotional response to the self. We already know that Cotard syndrome is associated with depression, and depression itself is characterised by a deadening of emotions. Of course, this is also consistent with what we know about the right hemisphere as being important for emotional processing, and the fact that patients with delusional disorders tend to have damage to the right side of their brains. But another important function of the right hemisphere is that it computes a sense of familiarity, whether this is the ability to recognise your body as your own, in the sense of Cotard syndrome, or even just the simple ability to recognise other people or objects. Because in order for your brain to recognise something as being familiar, it must be able to combine the sensory input that you are receiving with an emotional reaction. This input can be either internal signals from your body, which are called interoceptive signals, or they can be signals from your sensory organs, such as from your eyes, ears, skin and so on. But either way, these signals need to generate an emotional response in order for recognition and a feeling of familiarity to occur. So let's look at this in more detail, starting with interoceptive signals from your body. In 2022, a scientist called Dr. Philip Gerrans published a paper titled A Vessel Without a Pilot. In this paper, Dr. Gerrans proposed the hypothesis that Cotard's delusion is in fact a dyshomeostasis disorder. Homeostasis is the body's ability to regulate itself for optimal functioning and conveys signals regarding our basic drives such as hunger and sleep, as well as providing information regarding the internal state of the body and its internal organs. The brain receives all of this interoceptive information and uses it to control behaviour so that these drives are met. 
such as by increasing appetite to facilitate eating. Here, Dr. Gerans argues that the product of a normal, functioning homeostatic system is the sense of self, the experience of your body and its needs. However, if a patient is not receiving these interoceptive signals, then their sense of self breaks down and Cotard's delusion results. This would explain why Cotard patients, such as Mademoiselle X, make claims like they don't need to eat and report a lack of hunger, which makes sense given that appetite is a basic homeostatic drive. This therefore suggests that Cotard patients have a problem with their homeostatic system, as argued by Dr. Gerans in his dyshomeostasis hypothesis of Cotard syndrome. But again, this is a new and very recent finding, so unfortunately there is not research testing this yet. However, from a scientific perspective, there is fortunately another fascinating delusional disorder which is believed to have a very similar mechanism to Cotard syndrome, which can inform us about the importance of bodily or sensory signals and their role in enabling us to recognise ourselves or other people. This disorder is called Capgras syndrome. Patients with this syndrome experience the curious delusion that a loved one has been replaced by a total stranger, someone who is just pretending to be their loved one. They typically accuse those they are very close to emotionally, such as a parent, a spouse or their child, accusing them of being an imposter. For example, a 40-year-old female patient reported that her 9-year-old daughter was an imposter. She claimed that her real daughter had been taken away by social workers and put into foster care, and that the social workers had replaced her daughter with a girl who looked exactly like her daughter, but wasn't. But of course, in reality, her daughter had never even been placed into foster care. Another patient with cat breast syndrome was a 24-year-old man who believed that his mother had been replaced by government employees, who had been sent to extract information about his bad behaviour from his days in the military. And in reality, he had worked in the military, but the woman was of course his mother. So this obviously creates quite a strange situation for these unfortunate families, as well as for the psychiatrists who attempt to treat them. For example, if the so-called imposter is their mother, these patients will angrily say to their psychiatrist, Doctor, this woman is not my mother. I know she looks exactly like her and claims to be her, but she isn't. She's just some weird woman pretending to be my mother. And so even though the patients always recognise the person visually as their loved one, they don't really fully recognise them. Not on an emotional kind of level. This is because in normal, healthy people who do not have this delusion, your recognition of others works in the following way. Say you see your mother appear in the room. When you look at her face, you receive visual input and this visual input is then matched with your visual memory of your mother. This match between visual inputs and visual memory then triggers an emotional reaction, as it activates emotional parts of your brain and generates a feeling of emotional familiarity towards her. This enables you to feel like that woman is indeed your mother. And this is exactly the same when you are processing yourself as well. You are constantly receiving bodily inputs, whether these inputs are interoceptive or visual or whatever else, and you also get an emotional reaction in response to these bodily inputs, so that you feel like your body is your own body, instead of just some unfamiliar body that you don't properly recognise as being your own. Therefore, in order to recognise anything, there are two very important facets, both sensory or interoceptive and emotional. It simply isn't enough that something looks like something or someone you know, it has to feel familiar as well, which is created by having the emotional reaction, whether to your body or to someone else's. But why have I been going on about this other obscure disorder? Well, because cat breast syndrome, while also very rare, does also share a very similar underlying mechanism to Cotard's delusion. So similar, in fact, that both Cotards and Capgras are categorised as hypofamiliarity disorders. This means that they are disorders defined by a reduced sense of familiarity. In Cotard syndrome, this lack of familiarity is experienced in response to one's own body, whereas in Capgras delusion it is directed outwards at someone else. 
And this lack of familiarity in both disorders is caused by damage not just to the right hemisphere, but also, under the Ramachandran Blake's T hypothesis, due to damage regarding the emotional centre of the brain, called the limbic system. In fact, this hypothesis attempts to explain both delusions at the same time. But to understand this hypothesis, we must again turn to some basic brain anatomy. The limbic system is an aggregation of various brain structures located at the top of the brainstem and underneath the cerebral cortex, and forms the emotional centre of the brain. Whilst we know that the right hemisphere is important for processing emotions, it is here in the limbic system where emotions are actually generated, before being further processed within the cerebral cortex. And importantly, the limbic system is connected to various parts of the cortex which deal with your senses, as well as your sense of self, which we know from the right hemisphere hypothesis is a right hemisphere specialisation. These connections to various parts of the cortex which deal with your physical sense of self, your vision, your hearing and so on, enable you to have an emotional reaction to your bodily sensations and to what you are seeing and hearing in your external world. This is because these connections between the limbic system and various parts of your cortex enable fusion of bodily and sensory inputs with your emotional system. Which brings us to the Ramachandran and Blakesley hypothesis, as Ramachandran and Blakesley argue that both Kotal's delusion and Capgras syndrome demonstrate the importance of emotions for the ability to actually recognise yourself and your loved ones. When you look at another person's face, the visual input from your eyes travel to a region of the brain in the temporal lobe called the fusiform face area, or FFA. The fusiform face area is the main face recognition area of the brain, and of course enables you to visually recognise someone, if the visual input from your eyes matches your visual memory of that person. Furthermore, when this visual input to the FFA is received, and there is a match between visual input and visual memory, this also activates the limbic system. This is because there is a pathway from the fusiform face area to the limbic system. The activation of the limbic system produces the emotional response. This pathway thereby enables the visual input and emotional response to fuse, causing you to fully recognise your mother as being your mother, for example, as she both looks like your mother and feels like her as well. Therefore, Ramachandran and Blakesy argue that the cause of Capgras syndrome is the result of damage to this pathway which connects face recognition areas with the limbic system. So there is this local disconnection between both areas. This explains why patients are able to visually recognise their mother, but no longer feel an emotional reaction to her. This is then rationalised, probably by the left hemisphere, as doctor, she looks like my mother, but she's not my mother. She's just an imposter pretending to be her. This is due to the lack of emotion or lack of warmth that is experienced when they see their mother, or whoever else is the object of their delusion, who they should have an internal emotional reaction to but don't. This also explains another fascinating feature of Capgras syndrome though, to use the example of a patient seeing his mother in front of him believing that she is an imposter, when the mother isn't in the same room anymore but calls the patient on her phone instead, the patient will then answer the phone and respond with Mum! Hi, where are you? and successfully recognise her as being his mum. So in Capgras syndrome, the delusion does not exist when talking on the phone, but then as soon as the person enters the room, they're back to thinking that they are an imposter. This is because the damage which occurs in Capgras is a local disconnection, meaning that the damage is solely confined to the pathway which connects the face recognition areas with the limbic system, whereas the auditory system is not damaged, nor is the pathway connecting the auditory system with the limbic system. So when the patient hears his mother's voice on the phone and can't see her, he can recognise her, but when face to face with her he can't because of the severance between his FFA and limbic system which confuses the brain due to the lack of emotion. And as a quick aside, often these patients even report having this delusion about their own pets. If you look at the literature, there are numerous case studies online that you can read about 
where patients have reported thinking that their pet dog or cat is actually just another animal pretending to be their pet. One paper called this cat grass syndrome. And the patients are normally just as confused as everyone else is as well about how or why a pet or a person would do this, as often the patients are perfectly sane outside of this delusion. But anyway, Ramachandran and Blakesley argued that this same kind of concept also applies to the mechanism underlying Cotard's delusion. This time though, the damage has occurred not just to the wiring between the visual areas and the limbic system, but between all sensory areas with the limbic system, thereby preventing the patient from having an emotional reaction to any of their sensory inputs, both regarding their external world and their internal sense of self. This means that in Cotard syndrome, there is a global disconnection which affects all senses, including your sense of self. And if you are not able to combine your sensory inputs or your own bodily inputs with an emotional reaction, then you can't fully recognise your own body or feel like your body is your own body, just like we can't recognise other people without an emotional reaction to them either. And to return to the dual mechanism hypothesis, we all know that the left hemisphere likes to narrate what is going on, even when it doesn't know what is going on. And the end result of this experience of a lack of emotional response to one's body, and lack of emotions in general, as well as a decrease in homeostatic drive such as appetite, is that the patient ends up concluding, I am dead, probably due to the left hemisphere running wild. Which is how you get a patient such as Mademoiselle X, who concluded that she was dead and who starved herself to death. A big criticism of this hypothesis though, is that it's not ever been tested experimentally, which is incredibly unfortunate given that it would only take a simple experiment to explore this possibility. This is because every time we see someone that we recognise, we have a sweat response, which forms the basis of the skin conductance response test, whereby when we see someone familiar, we sweat. This is because when we see someone that we know, this activates the autonomic nervous system. To a small degree of course, but enough to be detected and exploited using this test. It would therefore be a very easy experiment to simply hook up a patient with one of these hypofamiliarity delusions and see how they swear in response to seeing images of their loved ones, as within Capgrass syndrome, or when paying attention to their own bodies, as within Cotard syndrome. If the Ramachandran Blakesley hypothesis is correct for either of these disorders, then these patients should either sweat less or not at all in response to these stimuli. But unfortunately, to my awareness, no such experiments have been performed, even now in the year of 2023. But aside from the reduced emotional response, there is also an additional reason, beyond whether the disconnection is global or local, as to why a patient might develop either Cotard's delusion or Capgras syndrome. In other words, why they might be more vulnerable towards a specific type of delusion over another. And this is because of a patient's attributional style. What is an attributional style? An attributional style is defined as the pervasive pattern to generate the causal explanation for positive and negative events. There are different ways of classifying attributional styles, but one way of classifying them is in terms of either an internal attributional style or an external attributional style. Someone with an internal attributional style has the tendency to attribute the causes of negative events to themselves, which is a typical attributional style of those who are depressed, for example, and how depressed a person is is correlated with the strength of their internalising attributional style. Whereas those of an external attributional style tend to attribute the causes of negative events to external factors, such as to other people or to situational aspects. The external attributional style is a tendency that people with psychosis have, particularly those who experience paranoid delusions. Researchers have also observed that females have an increased tendency for an internalised attributional style compared to males who tend to have an externalised attributional style. Consistent with this, there are higher rates of diagnosed depression in women and higher rates of diagnosed schizophrenia in men. Through the lens of attributional styles, the scientists Andrew Young and his colleagues argued in a paper dated 1996 that Cotard's delusion patients and Capgras syndrome patients adopt their different delusions based upon these differing attributional styles. Here, Cotard's delusion patients rationalise their lack of emotional experience 
by looking inwards, whilst Capgras syndrome patients rationalise it by looking outwards at the people around them. Instead of making sense of the perceptual and emotional disconnection by blaming others as being imposters, the Kotar patient concludes that they themselves are dead or don't exist. But now we turn to our third hypothesis. And our third hypothesis is that Kotar's delusion is a disorder of consciousness. Disorders of consciousness are a broad category and reflect a wide spectrum from mild confusion or delirium to the more obvious ones like a vegetative state or a coma. This transition from an awake and conscious state to a comatose one is characterised by a sort of signature of unconsciousness meaning that there are slower brain waves and reduced brain connectivity as you start to lose consciousness. This is also observable as a person is falling asleep, or when a person is already in deep sleep. So in light of everything that is known about Kotar's delusion, in the year of 2013, Dr. Vanessa Charland Verville and her team decided to investigate what is happening in the brain in a person with Kotar's syndrome and they performed the first ever PET study upon someone with Kotar's delusion. And by the way, PET, which is positron emission tomography, is a type of brain imaging in which scientists inject a tiny amount of radioactive glucose into participants' bloodstream. That blood, and the radioactive glucose that it's carrying, is then transported to brain areas which are showing increased activity. This is because active regions consume more oxygen and therefore receive more blood flow. Therefore, by measuring where the radioactive glucose is going, you can deduce which areas of the brain are more or less active during a certain activity or task. So back to the PET study. The experiment was performed on a 48-year-old man called Graham K. Graham had been severely depressed and had attempted suicide by electrocuting himself. Fortunately though, he had survived, but unfortunately, eight months later, he had become convinced that his brain had died when he had tried to kill himself. And in fact, a lot of Cotard syndrome patients actually seem to develop the disorder after having attempted suicide, just like Graham did. But anyway, they performed PET on Graham and they found some truly incredible results. Graham's brain actually resembled that of someone in a coma. So what does this mean? Well, they found out that his brain showed reduced activation within a vital brain network which is critical for mediating consciousness. This brain network is called the default mode network. The default mode network is formed of several different brain regions which include the precuneus, cingulate cortex, temporary parietal junction and frontal regions and it is precisely within these regions that Dr. Charlotte Verville and her team found decreased activity. So let's take a closer look at the default mode network. This is a network which is very important both when you are awake and when you are asleep, but in quite different ways. When you are awake, the default mode network is active, but only when you are in a so-called passive state, meaning when you are not actively doing anything, but instead of just thinking or daydreaming or otherwise just awake. Neuroscientists call this a resting state and the default mode network is the network which mediates this conscious awake state of being. If, however, you suddenly decide that you want to do something like a task or activity, then other networks, for which there are many, become activated and the default mode network subsequently takes more of a back seat but it is still active to some extent. The strength of the default mode network's activity while you are awake correlates with this level of consciousness that you have. In other words, while you are awake, the more conscious you are, the stronger your default mode network activity is during this passive awake state. And therefore, the patient in this experiment was showing default mode network activity, which reflects a reduced level of consciousness as the default mode network was less active. Now obviously this is just a single patient, 
and to my knowledge no other PET studies have been performed, nor have other experiments been done using other brain imaging techniques like MRI or EEG. However, in addition to these findings, there is also an even weirder manifestation of Cotard's delusion which also provides evidence for this hypothesis, called Cotard's parasomnia. Parasomnia is an abnormal disruption of sleep, such as having a nightmare, sleep talking, sleep walking or having a night seizure. And as you might guess, a Cotard's parasomnia is where a person experiences the Cotard's delusion, but only while in a half-awake, half-asleep state. In other words, they only experience the delusion when they are roaming the land between awake and asleep. In a fascinating experiment performed just a few years ago and published in 2020, Dr Valentina Noni and her colleagues in London investigated three fascinating cases of Cotard's parasomnia. Dr Noni and her team analysed EEG recordings of three participants' brains with this syndrome. EEG, by the way, or an electroencephalogram, uses electrodes on the scalp to measure the electrical activity of neurons and to measure brain waves, as active neurons release electromagnetic waves which can be detected by electrodes. Dr Noni found, alongside the standard decreased right hemisphere activity, that there was activation of two separate networks. We will cover the first one first, which was the default mode network, which on first glance you might think is strange given that it is a network which is active when you are awake. But the default mode network is actually quite complicated. Well, yes, it is active while you are awake, mostly when you are just passive and resting. It is also active when you are falling asleep, and when you are in deep sleep. In fact, the deeper into sleep you fall, the more active your default mode network is. And as you are falling asleep, while the default mode network gets stronger, other networks in your brain which are also active when you are awake start to decrease their own activity as you fall asleep. And there are many of these other networks, but the relevant one for us is the salience network, which forms the second network which shows strange activity when Dr Noni and her team perform their experiment. When you are awake, there is this kind of Batman and Robin activity between the salience network and the default mode network, whereby the salience network is dominant and default mode network is active, but not quite as active as the salience network. As you fall asleep, this Batman and Robin effect switches, such that the default mode network takes over, while the salience network decreases its activity. This is what happens in a healthy and neurotypical brain. But when this doesn't happen, in other words, when the salience network doesn't switch off, you get insomnia, where the person can't fall asleep. In Dr Noni's experiment with these three Cotard's parasomnia patients, they found that not only was the default mode network active, but so was the salience network. Whilst Cotard's parasomnia and Cotard's delusion are two separate disorders, there is clear crossover between this nighttime Cotard's delusion versus the daytime Cotard's delusion. Because again, we see the same patterns that are consistent with our dual mechanism hypothesis. The Cotard's parasomnia patients had right hemisphere deficits, and this may have caused the left hemisphere to once again become the creative interpreter, and falsely conclude, in this confusing, half awake, half asleep state, that the patient was dead. And clearly not only does there need to be balance between the left and right hemispheres to avoid delusional thinking, but also there needs to be balance between these networks, such as between the default mode network and the salience network, in order to prevent a delusion like Cotard's. And this ultimately supports the hypothesis that in normal Cotard's delusion, the default mode network is not active enough while you are awake, and that this distorted network activity causes reduced consciousness. In both Cotard's delusion and Cotard's parasomnia, this confusing brain state potentially gets interpreted by the left hemisphere as being evidence that you are dead, whether you are awake or half asleep. <laughs>